Greetings and welcome to Kapoto 360 Podcast, an initiative brought to you by Activist Zimbabwe and Youth Perspectives Initiative, where our conversations revolve around public finance management and scrutinizing public management and public uh, accountability apparatus accountable, trying to introspect whether they're effective and if they're serving their determined mandate. And today I am, I am joined by the Citizens Coalition for Change spokesperson, a former student leader, and a youth activist, Comrade Gift Ostello Sizim. Comrade Ostello, please meet the viewers. Thank you very much, Comrade Liam. It's a pleasure. So, getting on to today's conversation, we are looking at the general uh, Auditor General's report and its recommendations that those found on the wrong side of the law should be held accountable. And also that government should conduct forensic audits over how public uh, resources were used and even to have a trace down of how the missing funds disappeared or who is then responsible. Then we also have the Public Accounts Committee's report on the COVID-19 funds, which also stipulated that within the publication of that report, 180 days after all those found on the wrong side of the law should be held accountable. But since, since that day, that is the 22nd of May up to today, there hasn't been any action taken by government. And to that end, I'll pose a question to you, Comrade Ustalus. What's your general perspective in terms of the effectiveness of the institutions responsible to enforce public accountability in terms of public resource governance? No, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, Zimbabwe is, um, is a constitutional democracy. It has very strong blueprints that guide uh, the functions, duties, and the responsibility of state institutions. The Constitution of 2009, which was a negotiated document, produced clearly uh, state institutions who have got a function to make sure that there's public accountability. Yes. Our greatest challenge that we face as a country is number one, implementation. Number two, since the coming in of the new dispensation uh, through a military coup in November 2017, We've seen the increase of impunity where those who are found guilty by state institutions can continue doing the same uh, you know, acts of corruption, arbitrage, without um, you know, accounting. So the greatest challenge at the present moment is increased impunity. Number three, the greatest challenge we face as a country is the challenge in and around um, executive tyranny, what we call in the citizens' coalition the encroaching of the executive into the legislative arm and the judiciary. Some would coin it as judicial capture, but we don't see it limited to the capture of the judiciary because the constitution provides for separation of powers. The constitution provides clearly the powers that uh, are with the judiciary to interpret the law that are with the legislature to make the law and of course the executive to implement the same. But what we see is the judiciary is the executive that is encroached into the legislature, that is encroached into the judiciary. Therefore making it impossible when the auditor general's report comes out and pinpoints members within the executive or those linked with the executive powers that be, it becomes a problem for the judiciary to implement because the executive has become power unto itself. So the legislative arm of this country has been rendered incapable. You know that within the legislative framework, there are committees that run different accounting mechanisms. And one such committee is the Public Accounts Committee. We had the responsibility to check through our MP Honorable Tendai Bid. And you know what happened? The assault to the opposition had appearing to the Public Accounts Committee to hold those that are found guilty of corruption to account. Because the Auditor General's report produces the report, but it is up to the state institutions and arms of government to then execute the recommendations of the report. Lastly, fifthly, the greatest problem uh, uh, that we face in Zimbabwe outside uh, uh, issues of executive tyranny is also that institutions of government have been rendered dysfunctional. So it, it becomes impossible because the Auditor General's report does not have powers to prosecute. It can only produce a blueprint. 
it can only expose where there are leakages. It can expose who, when and how. But it doesn't have powers to prosecute. And the state then created the Anti-Corruption Commission and the chapter of institutions to then go with that. But you know that they are appointed by the executive. So the fourth problem of the executive tyranny is appearing now against in and around prosecution of those that are found cute. That's why people like uh, Henrita Rushua can go out and have uh, pomp and fanfare and, and, and throw uh, 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 banquets and parties in the leafy suburbs of this country because they know that they can go into court today and go out tomorrow. So that's why there's this big debate around catch and release where those that are found guilty are actually uh, prosecuted. Ironically, those that try to help the state to expose certain elements within the government, like investigative journalists, find themselves being the ones that are now prosecuted. So the selective application of the law is the biggest problem, but it comes out of the executive that is encroached into the judicial space and uh, uh, the, the legislative arm of this country, making the principle of separation of powers impossible and therefore Zimbabwe is suffering from the current predicament in terms of public accountability in our country. Okay, uh, but just to direct you a bit into the strength of the legislature as the lawmaking institution, what would you have done differently if you were to be the governing party, if you were to have the two-thirds majority in parliament, what would you have done differently? A, a two-thirds majority for the alternative is very, very important. Uh, it is very, very important in the following respect. Number one, the legislative arm of the country has a constitutional obligation to hold the executive to account. So the first and most important constitutional duty of the executive, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, Mr. Mnangako in office, it doesn't matter whether it's President Chamisa in office, it doesn't matter whether it's Kisnot Mukwash. The most important thing is that those that are within the executive must be held to account. It doesn't matter whether these are triple C cabinet ministers. It doesn't matter whether these are MDC or Mavambugusile don cabinet ministers. They must be held to account. That is the first duty of the legislature. Once you get into the legislative arm of the country, you don't go there with a political jacket. You go there with a constitutional responsibility to advance the interest of the constitution of this country, which is the collective interest of our country. So the executive must be held to account. So in a situation uh, of public accounts, if there are leakages within the executive, it is the duty of the legislature to make sure that those that are found guilty of corruption are held to account. Number two and most important, to then hold different functionaries and institutions within government. For example, the Arab PZ in Zimbabwe has been used as an instrument of corruption. It is the gateway to corruption facilitating quasi-fiscal activities for those that are connected to the executive. It is the duty of the legislative arm of this country to make sure that those that, because these are public servants, the governor of this country is a public servant. It is the duty of the legislative arm to call the, that's why it's in the constitution, that if you don't go when the parliament has called you to come and answer to certain questions, you must actually be uh, uh, prosecuted. But that has not happened. A lot of people defy uh, 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 public accounts committees and different parliamentary committees. You know what happens to the uh, GMB command agriculture scandal? All these are part and parcel of the challenges that we face. You know that the greatest instrument of arbitrage is the Dutch auction system. We have argued as Triple C that that thing must be abandoned because it's being used to facilitate corruption. We have argued that Zimbabwe must go back to using the US dollar as the instrument of exchange in the interim while we work with our macroeconomic framework so that we return back to our own currency. But they won't do it because they are benefiting from a, a, a printing money. They are benefiting from the informal, the difference between the informal exchange rate and the informal black market exchange rate. So they're buying money from, from the Arab business at a lower rate, at a formal rate, and selling it in the streets. So that is the biggest challenge. The Dutch auction system has siphoned more than $2 billion a year from a, 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 a taxpayer's man. So... So those that are doing this cannot account because when they are called to parliament, they can't account. You can see the arrogance with different uh, state functionaries. So holding state institutions to account is important. And you can only do that when you've got a, uh, a two-thirds majority. Lastly, 
a two-thirds majority will help us to then make sure that we pass pro-poor laws. We are struggling at the present moment with Mtuli uh, Ngube's uh, uh, neoliberal policies, a neoliberal budget. Mtuli Ngube is borrowing on behalf of the taxpayers' money without the consent of the taxpayers. When the law stipulated is very clear that for any specific budget that goes beyond what is stipulated in law, for the Arabs to borrow, it must be approved by parliament. So ZAN weaponizes and abuses the two-thirds majority to pass anti-poor laws. They are borrowing on behalf of their generation. They are borrowing on behalf of our generation. They are borrowing on behalf of the unborn. So those who are going to be born in the next uh, uh, 10 years are going to live to service a debt that was borrowed by Mtuli Ngub. Where is the money going? It's not going to benefit uh, the, 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 the public. The money is used to, to hire private jets. The money is used to finance uh, uh, political parties. The money is used to sponsor terror and havoc in our country. So that is a problem with the fact that we have a parliament that is weaponized to pass anti poor laws. The new liberal uh, policies that I've talked to, borrowing right now, they are mortgaging the country to different players internationally. So we are going to live with the leakers of trying to repay debts to the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, repay debts to different international financial institutions. But they are also doing these issues around, you know, the mining scandal, where they are uh, obviously uh, giving mining rights, tax uh, tax uh, breaks to different companies like way big issues that we have to live with in the next government. So that is successful because they've got a two-thirds majority. So having a two-thirds majority for the triple C is important to pass pro-poor laws. It's important to make sure that you scrutinize law, to make sure that you engage with the public, to make sure that you engage with actors within the civic society and other uh, uh, pressure groups so that you engage with different stakeholders before you pass laws. Last but not least, around the need for two-thirds majority is that we are going to utilize that. It's important for Triple C to have a two-thirds majority because you are then able to deploy people with the necessary legislative skills. The current predicament that we face is that the parliament of Zimbabwe is full of flippists. It is full of people who don't know what they are there to do. Their preoccupation is getting coupons. Their preoccupation is sleeping in hotels. Their preoccupation is primitive accumulation of wealth. Their preoccupation is power retention. There is no robust debate. You can only count but a few people, majority of them obviously from the alternative, the Citizens Coalition for Change, who are engaged in robust parliamentary debate which advances the agenda for public accountability in our country. So the issue of quality is important because the current composition of the august house is not what zimbabwe needs so there must be a clear deployment of people with the necessary legislative skills to hold the executive to account to articulate policy to craft the laws that are consistent with the constitution consistent with the values consistent with the global dynamics because you need people that understand where the world is going where the international financial markets are going People who understand what drives Zimbabwe, what is the identity of our country, what is the broad national vision, because policies must then be crafted to achieve that particular national vision. But the current predicament and the composition, the quality of members of parliament makes it impossible for that robust debate and discourse to happen in our motherland. Okay, you spoke of uh, debt accumulated to sponsor uh, corruption and to sponsor repression and to retain, um, I would say, fis fiscal profiligacy within government. And you also spoke of government extravagance. So three questions to you, Comrade Ostalus. What's the Citizens Coalition for Change's position on illegitimate debt? Then secondly, what is also your proposed solution to government uh, extravagance? Then lastly as well, what is then the way forward in status quo? What is then the way forward? What is your strategic plan or what is your strategic pathway in terms of dealing with uh, corruption and also trying to promote accountability within public resource governance? Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think that um, for Triple C, uh, our belief is that um, we must be able to create strong institutions. It's the first and most uh, important thing 
Because when you have strong institutions, it means that you don't have a culture of impunity. Because it is the biggest challenge that we are facing to deal with the corruption in our country. Our policy proposition, which is uh, captured in our new Zimbabwe blueprint, which is going to be coming out very soon, uh, we are setting everything in motion to march to the launch of our um, policy uh, blueprint in a conference to make sure that uh, we articulate succinctly how we intend uh, to resolve some of these um, issues. So the first thing that we propose in that blueprint is that number one, we must create strong institutions. Number two is that we must deal with impunity. We must increase the cost of being corrupt in this country. If you look at Rwanda, it makes it impossible. And you can even look at China. The current government prides itself in its relations with China. But how did China under Jinping manage to deal with corruption? Those who are within the rank and file of the Communist Party have been in, in and out of prisons because of corruption in China. So, because corruption is a culture, once you increase the cost of being corrupt, you make it impossible for, you, uh, for members of your organization for them to be corrupt. And the most important thing that we articulate in our blueprint is about the leader. We have said that every leader must show by leading by example because everyone within the rank and file of government, they follow the tone of the leader. When the leader is motivated by primitive accumulation of wealth, primitive accumulation of power and retention of the same, it means that the subordinates follow the same. So it is also important for the leader to show the tone, not just in rhetoric, but in practice. It's important for the leader to be clear, to be firm on dealing with corruption. That is the lessons from countries like Singapore, from countries like the Asian Tigers that have managed to deal with uh, decades of uh, impunity and corruption. Number four is obviously dealing with uh, leakages. Zimbabwe loses billions from illicit financial flows. Zimbabwe loses billions from uh, 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 domestic debt and external debt that is acquired without the consent of different stakeholders. So we believe that we must strengthen parliament, we must strengthen chapter 12 institutions, we must strengthen the tripartite negotiating forum because the working workers in this country are important. The ordinary people are important. So the engagement between government and the civic society as representative of the ordinary people is important. So that those who are making laws are conscious and cognizant because Zimbabwe is not sh short of people who have invested in economics, people have invested in public accountability issues, people are invested in and around uh, issues uh, around transparency, the running of uh, government at that level. So the in the intention of Triple C is to say, let the government open up for bureaucrats, for technocrats that have amassed this level of intellectual wealth and practical experience in different, we've got people that have worked for the African Development Bank, people that have been to the World Bank itself, people that have been to different countries to come back and so that we rebuild our country. So in terms of dealing with our economic framework, we need an investment in technocrats. So there must be investment in technocrats and a government that is able to listen to the advice of the technocrats. Because politicians are there as the representatives of the people. But there must be bureaucrats, there must be technocrats that are given the ability to be able to make technical decisions in consultation with the people so that our country can be able to move forward. Not to come to bring in tech, uh, technocrats for them to then advance your primitive accumulation of power without advancing the national vision. Lastly, what we think is very important is, making, is having clear policies. Our policies must be clear, it must be consistent. We must not have policies that come out. Look at how we have been amending the constitution. Look at how many statutory instruments have come out to the us out of the informal traders, us out to business, us out to different players. So we must have consistency. You know, look at what happened when Tulingube came out. Uh, in fact, the Arab said governor coming overnight and announcing policies in the middle of the night that, no, no, we are banning uh, lending from banks. So such levels of inconsistency must be stopped. So we must have consistent policy making. We must be consistent in terms of what government wants to do and be decisive about it. So that's uh, the most uh, important thing. And it's going to be coming out uh, in our policy uh, blueprint. And lastly, what we think uh, should be done going forward, we think that we cannot liberalize the economy 
without liberalizing politics. We think that where Zimbabwe is getting it wrong is thinking that the current regime is convinced that you can liberalize the economy, open it for business, engage international financial institution, engage business, engage investors without dealing with the politics. Because the greatest problem in our country is the politics stupid. We must fix our politics. Zimbabwe suffers from a broken down social contract. There is lack of a relationship and a consent between those who govern and those that are being governed. The current Mnangakwa's administration is a contested state. So we must resolve that by having a free and fair process. So that when we have a free and fair process, it means that we are able to resolve our economy. Because when the politics is stupid, the economy follows suit. So we must fix the politics. How do we fix the politics? Let the will of the people be respected. Once we do that, we must be able to then have the will of the people being followed, the economy failing, uh, following suit, because the economy is about confidence. Confidence comes from electoral uh, processes. So that is what we uh, propose, in short, is triple uh, C. Okay, Comrade Ostalos, you spoke of pro poor policies, and which signals to maybe the growing economic inequality in the country, and of course it's traced down to leakages and failure to action the Auditor General's uh, recommendations. So then, do you think that the country is in the right direction from your perspective as a part? Do you think the country is in the right direction of economic recovery? I think that Zimbabwe is in autopilot. The country is in a journey to nowhere in terms of the economy. Mtulingube is clueless. Mtulingube does not understand what it takes to run an economy of this country. The Triple C government knows what it takes. We've got a history of running the country's economy. We did this during our yesterday's movement, during the government of national unit. That the first thing first is we must restore uh, the social contract. The center in the current present moment does not hold. The investor does not know who is who in government, who's doing what, there are three centers of power. So Zimbabwe is a contested state. We must restore that our microeconomic framework is not able to resolve the Zimbabwe's economic uh, problem. The macroeconomic framework is even worse. Tulingube's uh, domestic uh, resource mobilization program is not yielding results because there's no confidence from ordinary people. The re-engagement process is not working. So Zimbabwe is in, is in an autopilot to nowhere. We must be able to fix our policy so that we come back to build our country. We believe that the regime of Mr. Mnangawa lacks what it takes to run a functional economy. There was will from uh, Professor Mtulingube when he came uh, into office. One of his greatest pronouncements was that when I get there as a Minister of Finance, the first thing that I would do is to remove uh, the bond note because it was caught in flagranti delicto. When uh, my brother, when you, you find your girlfriend in a compromised position with another guy, trust collapses. So this is the situation with the bond note. It was caught in what in law is called flagranti delicto. So Zimbabweans don't trust the bond note. And we have argued as triple C that let us return Zimbabwe back into the basket of multiple currency regime in the temporary measure. Mtulungube proposed that because he knew as an economist that bad money drives out good money. It's a basic economic uh, principle. But he's failing to do that now because the bond note is used as an instrument of arbitrage. So we think that with that direction we are going nowhere. The current government lacks the ideological impetus so on one end, the government says we are a left movement. We subscribe to Marxist-Leninist ideological standpoint. But Mtul Ngube is saying we are running a private sector-led economy. So Mtul Ngube is to the extreme right. He's saying let us compensate uh, farmers. Let us open Zimbabwe for anyone to come and loot. While it's at the same time, some within the rank and file of ZANU PF are still saying ZANU is a Marxist uh, movement. So that lack of ideological compass makes it impossible for Zimbabwe's economy to thrive because there must be clarity at the level of the vision, at the level of ideological disposition, so that it informs the policies that you do. There's an assault to the working class. There's an assault to the poor. There's an assault to the oppressed. The gap between the rich and poor is widening. Poverty is rampaging our country. 
There is no proper uh, proposals from government. There is only extraction. There is only a process to loot from government. And the current government is looting like there's no tomorrow. So that is the current problem. If you look at our debt uh, program, it's about primitive accumulation. There is no care about the future. There is no investment about the future. There is no thinking about the future. Resources are being siphoned out of the country. There is no protection of domestic natural resources by the government. But what you see is rhetoric. So there is disconnection between rhetoric from those that speak on behalf of ZANU and what is happening practically on the ground. Because the resources are moving out of the country without uh, uh, accountability. So the poor are suffering. The country is going to suffer. The triple C government under Chamisa is going to be inheriting a mess of an economy. It's going to take us a lot to rebuild this country. But I can assure you that we've got the confidence to do so. Uh, sorry to cut you short there. Um, because we are almost uh, eating into our time. So, based on all that you have articulated here, the status quo that you've described, the proposed way forward, you have addressed the Leninist question. So then, what's your parting shot to the young people of Zimbabwe ahead of 2023 elections? And as well as also looking into the broader future of resource governance in Zimbabwe, transparency in government. I think that uh, my words uh, to young people is that uh, the future is in our hands as a generation. Uh, like Fanon would always say that every generation must be able to discover its own mission. Our mission as a generation is to bring transformation. There is, there is no one who can be a hero in two struggles. The liberation generation which was appreciated so much, did so much to bring the political freedom that we need as a country. But the next generational responsibility is about transformation. ZANU cannot lead the transformation struggle. We have the responsibility to lead the transformation consensus as a generation. I urge young people, you can see that ZANU is going hook, line and sinker to go to his default mood to try and be violent. Let us remain peaceful. Let us come together as a generation and reshape our future. We cannot let the present hold the future in suffocation. I urge young people, particularly the major demographic group of those between the ages of 18 and 35, to register as voters because your vote is your power. There is no any other solution. This country came via the power of the gun, but the transformation struggle will come via the power of the ballot. But you can only do so when the majority of young people can be able to record their displeasure and use the election as a point of entry to be able to bring about change and transformation in our country. So I urge young people, I urge members of our generation to be able to come together so that we open the future whom the president is holding in suffocation. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. That was our comrade gift of Stalos Ziva, the Citizens Coalition for Change, deputy spokesperson. And to him, from him, I actually gave the nuggets that one, we need to strengthen our institutions, rebrand our public institutions such that we rekindle the lost confidence. And thirdly, policy consistency. Then also again, as these parting shots to young people that we all register to vote and we all ensure that we play our part in fulfilling a generational mandate. So I was your host, Liam Takura Kaninga, and this was Kapoto 360 Podcast. See you next time.